afternoon, or if the time zones are such, uh, good morning. Um, it's uh, a privilege for me to be able to share with you the um, uh, series of webinars, and um, I enjoy training. Uh, I'm more used to doing it in person, but uh, the webinar is a good way to disseminate a, a lot of information. So the uh, overall course is about uh, petroleum geology and geophysics. And um, as Danielle said, I uh, well, in September, I'll hit my uh, 40th year uh, in this uh, industry. And uh, part of my uh, payback is to try to uh, educate, uh, uh, especially young people, about uh, what we do in the oil and gas industry. So um, a lot of the materials that I'll show today and in the other 32 uh, uh, lessons uh, is based on information that uh, I developed at ExxonMobil or colleagues of mine at ExxonMobil developed. Uh, some of it is material that uh, I added since, uh, since I retired from uh, ExxonMobil. The target audience is upper class geoscience majors to those that are in the early stages of uh, graduate studies. Uh, depends on how connected your department is to uh, oil and gas as to um, what the uh, pr appropriate audience might be on each of the campuses. There are some copyrighted materials and they will be noted with the uh, copyright uh, 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 markings. And uh, if anyone were to use some of these materials, uh, the copyright uh, laws need to be applied. And uh, one final note is that the um, webinars and the materials on the internet are intended for educational purposes for um, college, university students, undergrad or grad. It is not intended to be used by other people commercially uh, for other type of business purposes. So you're welcome to use it uh, while you're still in school. Uh, once you become uh, employed, then uh, it would not be appropriate for you to uh, share these materials. Uh, this is a list of the different lessons. Uh, today we'll talk about focus of industry. On Thursday, we'll talk about introduction to petroleum elements. You can see that overall there are 34. Uh, 33 of them are, are done. I think maybe all 33 are on the website. I still have to uh, finalize uh, lesson number 34. And we'll see how far we can get down the list uh, by the end of the summer. I'm hoping to get at least a dozen of them done. Uh, when I uh, teach, uh, uh, well, I taught a semester at uh, Texas A&M, um, and how I would use this in a uh, uh, semester type course is uh, let's say we are in uh, unit number three, that means homework uh, exercise material for unit number two would have been completed by the students. So I would start a session by reviewing that and answering any uh, uh, remaining questions. Uh, then I would give the lecture for unit number three, and then I would introduce the exercises, the homework assignments for uh, lesson number three. And uh, uh, that is uh, essentially what I did uh, for the uh, time I was uh, teaching at Texas A&M. Uh, when it comes to recommended books, uh, I could have a very long uh, list. Uh, these are probably the five top uh, books that uh, I would refer people to if they wanted to uh, delve deeper into uh, petroleum uh, geology and geophysics. Let me talk uh, a little bit about the relevance uh, of uh, geology and geophysics to energy companies, uh, uh, oil and gas companies. And in order to do that, let me pose the question, uh, what drives today's oil companies, uh, whether they're humongous uh, com companies like uh, ExxonMobil or Shell, or they're small companies uh, that might have uh, five or six uh, geoscientists? The uh, chart on the upper left shows energy supply, and you could also say energy demand. It's from uh, the year 1990, and then it's projected out to the year 2040. The vertical axis is a million barrels per day oil equivalent. 
So oil is our common denominator. So the amount of gas that is uh, produced per day or per year uh, is converted into an equivalent oil uh, value. Uh, coal is converted into an oil value and other uh, which would include uh, wind and hydrothermal and uh, nuclear um, and biofuels would be another. Uh, you can see that the uh, demand is rising and from uh, 2015 projecting out 25 years into the future, uh, it rises about 45%. Uh, that's an annual growth of uh, a little over one and a half percent per year. Industrialized uh, countries like the US and Canada, uh, our energy demand will probably decrease in 25 years due to efficiencies, uh, but there are emerging countries such as uh, China and India where the demand for energy will grow quite uh, uh, significantly uh, in 25 years. Uh, this chart has the same age range, 1990 to 2040. Uh, the vertical uh, axis, again, is a million barrels per day oil equivalent. And you can see how that uh, rises. Um, and out until 2015, that is historical data, 2015 to 2040 is projected data. The uh, Left side, uh, from 1990 to 2015, in green, it says existing production. So that's how much uh, oil and gas and coal and uh, other sources of energy we have actually been using. And then from 2015 to 2040 is projected uh, uh, up with the, uh, with the increase uh, that is uh, predicted to uh, exist. The green um, that uh, goes down almost to zero is production from existing fields. Uh, that means if we just produced from reservoirs that we already are producing from, we didn't add any more reservoirs, we didn't find any more fields, uh, you can see that in 25 years, our existing production would almost go down to zero. Uh, that leaves the orange triangle uh, that is the uh, gap between the energy demand and our existing production. So the challenge for energy industries is to try to fill that gap. The way we would fill that gap is in three uh, methods. First is to make new discoveries of oil and gas and coal and uh, uh, non-hydrocarbon uh, uh, sources of energy. Uh, we have explored quite a number of the basins around the world. That's not to say we are not going to find some additional giant oil and gas fields, but we can't depend strictly on making new discoveries to keep pace with demand. The second way we can fill that orange triangle is through static reserves. That is hydrocarbon that we know is in the ground but currently we can't extract those hydrocarbons at a profit. An example of a static reserve is the um, unconventional uh, resources, uh, uh, tight oil sands, tight gas sands that have uh, been in the news for about the last 10 years. 10 years ago, those would have been considered static reserves. We knew hydrocarbons were there, but we didn't have the technology or the price structure to extract them and make money. And primarily through the development of horizontal drilling and fracking, we now are able to produce uh, a lot of uh, unconventional oil and gas, and that helps fill up that orange triangle. The third that is listed there is probable. That would be a case where perhaps uh, Shell uh, today makes a, a giant discovery somewhere in the world. They have one well, and it looks uh, promising to be an economic quantity of uh, oil or gas, but management does not want to approve uh, the expense. Let's say they have to uh, build an offshore platform. Uh, that might be on the order of one or two billion dollars. And before they commit to making that much of an uh, outlay of uh, cash, they want to make sure that there is enough oil or gas so that they can recover that uh, cost 
and make some money as well. So they would uh, want to drill either, some companies would call them delineation wells, some companies call them confirmation wells. They might want uh, two or three or four additional wells to verify that yes, there is enough hydrocarbon there that we can get to the surface and sell so that it justifies the expense of developing a new field. Uh, this is an interesting chart. It's from 1997, uh, published by Edwards. It's the only chart I'm aware of that uh, is bold enough to go from uh, 1911, it looks like, 1912, out to the year 3000. And in case you're wondering, I do not intend to still be working in oil and gas in the year 3000. Um, it has Edwards' estimate as to where energy demand would be, that's the solid yellow line, and then how we would meet that demand. And uh, you can see the crude oil is in, uh, in green, natural gas is in red, coal is in gray, uh, then it's nuclear, solar, wind, thermal, and hydroelectric. I've uh, blocked off a 40-year career starting at 2015, uh, going to 20. Uh, 55. And so you can see if this estimate is anywhere near to being correct, that if you started a career with an energy company, uh, 2015, 2016, 2020, 2022, you would still uh, be in the uh, region where we are depending a lot on extracting oil and gas from the subsurface. So uh, this to me uh, gives me comfort in advising young people, yes, uh, you can have a career and it can last uh, 40 or so years uh, working um, uh, geoscience for an oil or gas company. We talk about a fully integrated oil company. Um, with uh, oil and gas, we first have to uh, discover where it is and uh, prove that there's enough there that's going to be economic. That's represented by the uh, picture of the drill rig. We have to take the raw materials, uh, let's say oil, uh, we have to send that to the refinery. It has to be uh, processed so that we have usable products. And then on the right, uh, we have a, a gas station, a petrol station, uh, and that's where uh, we would sell our product and, uh, and make money. So a fully integrated oil company would be one that would do everything from trying to figure out where in the world should we look for oil and gas, how do we discover it, how do we get it out of the, out of the ground, then refining it, and then selling it to a motorist or for heating oil or for airplane fuel or petrochemical products. The first half, uh, finding it, getting out of the ground and delivering it to the refinery, we refer to that as the upstream. And then from the uh, refining process to marketing, uh, we consider that downstream. Now, if I was doing this live, I would ask my first question. It's not a real hard one, but uh, if you think about people with a geoscience uh, profession, uh, would they tend to be in the upstream or the downstream? And of course, they're in the upstream where we're trying to figure out what's in the subsurface where might there be oil or gas uh, uh, reserves, and how do we get them out of the ground? Uh, hopefully, I've done my uh, retirement planning effectively enough that I will not, uh, in a few years, be behind the counter at the gas station asking you if you want a hot dog to go along with your fill-up of gas. So if we think about the upstream, we can further break that down into three phases. Uh, first, we have to find oil and gas pools or reservoirs or fields. Uh, we have uh, uh, about 700, 800 sedimentary basins on our planet. Uh, which of those basins are most promising? If we have a basin with a lot of potential, uh, maybe a government is offering up some uh, lease blocks uh, in that basin, so we have to decide which Basin, which blocks within that basin would we be interested on, in bidding on? And then if we are successful and get our bid accepted, we now have a, a piece of real estate in which to try to uh, drill wells and find oil and gas. 
So where exactly on at that block that we have, or maybe we have three blocks in the lease sale, or maybe we have 10, where do we drill to try to find oil and gas? So the finding of hydrocarbon is uh, what is done by explorationists. So that could be an exploration group or an exploration team, or if you're talking about a, a super major uh, like ExxonMobil, there is an exploration company within ExxonMobil and within Shell and with, within BP. The uh, second part of the upstream, once we find it, we have to figure out how are we gonna get it out of the ground so that we can uh, refine it and uh, eventually sell it. We need to know where in detail are the oil and gas reserves. Uh, if um, it's onshore, we may have to build some facilities. If it's offshore, we'll probably have to build some facilities. An example of an offshore facility would be an offshore platform. And ultimately, uh, my boss is gonna ask me, Fred, is this uh, new discovery gonna be profitable? Are we going to get enough value out of the sale of the oil and gas that it will offset all of the costs? So the people that worry about how to get it out of the ground and uh, how are we going to start to uh, produce the oil and gas or, or let it uh, flow up to the surface, uh, that's the development geoscientist. Uh, and that could be done in a, a, a team or a department or a development company. The third part of the upstream is to get it out of the ground and to the refinery. Uh, the development people worry about how to start the flow of oil and gas. The production geoscientists are the people that worry about how do we maximize the recovery of oil and gas from the field? How do we extend the life of the field for 10 or 20 or 30 or maybe 50 years? And then uh, they also have to worry about how are we gonna get the crude uh, from where we uh, get it out of the subsurface uh, to the refinery. So each of these phases, exploration, development, and production uh, is characterized by drilling wells. So we have to drill wells to find the oil and gas, to delineate the fields, and then to recover oil and gas so we can sell products. So, uh, Drilling wells is a very important activity within the upstream. Uh, exploration wells are drilled to try to discover new hydrocarbon reserves. Development company or, or development geoscientists drill wells to delineate a new field and determine how best to extract the hydrocarbons that are in that new field. And then production geoscientists, uh, they want to drain the field uh, and their goal is to maximize how much we get out in terms of oil and gas while minimizing how much we spend to get the hydrocarbons out. So industry uses technology. Uh, I have here primarily reflection seismology. I guess that's a bit of a biased state, uh, statement on my part, but uh, seismic is a very important part of trying to figure out what's in the subsurface, either in the exploration stage, in the field development stage, or the field production stage. We do need to drill our wells wisely. Uh, wells these days are considerably expensive. Uh, quite a few wells are over $250 million. I know of one case where a single well was drilled for $400 million trying to find oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico. The uh, placement on the surface of the well and then the path of the well bore going down to the target can be very critical to success. There are a number of cases where one company drilled and didn't find anything. Later on, another company drilled in the same area, uh, maybe moved the uh, well uh, a mile or so and uh, uh, tapped into the uh, edge of a major oil or gas field. So the question is, how can we determine before we drill uh, what we're going to find after we start drilling? And this is where understanding the subsurface, both in terms of the rocks that are down there and the fluids those rocks hold uh, is very important. And this, uh, desire to determine before we drill what we're going to find 
That leads to the need for geologists, to, for geophysicists, for other specialists uh, in uh, science and math that are focused on giving us good images of the subsurface and then interpreting those images in terms of geology and fluid content. Uh, this uh, slide has uh, seven main uh, types of geoscientists that uh, oil and gas companies are always looking for. Uh, geophysics is an important uh, element of uh, uh, determining what's down in the earth uh, in exploration, uh, development, and production stage. Uh, we do a lot of regional geological studies. Uh, we do basin modeling, trying to uh, understand as best we can how the basin formed and filled, how the sediments have been compacted and heated up, and how uh, organic material in source rocks have uh, yielded oil and gas and where that oil and gas may have uh, migrated to. Uh, structural geology is a, a big, um, uh, of big importance to oil and gas companies, as is stratigraphy and sedimentology. Uh, we also have a lot of people that are uh, focused on geochemistry. And then uh, not so much in exploration, but field development and uh, field production, uh, we have a lot of specialists that worry about reservoir characterization. Uh, that would be a reservoir geologists, reservoir engineers. Uh, this is a diagram that a friend of mine, Mike Payne, came up with a number of years ago, and he calls it the oil company's pyramid. So at the top, the apex is the dollar signs. Uh, in a free market society, companies are interested in doing something whereby they can earn a profit. And for oil and gas companies, uh, we are interested in a profit, and those uh, profits are primarily uh, distributed to our shareholders. Uh, in order to get money, we have to find and develop and produce and refine and sell hydrocarbons. In order to do that, we have to drill wells. And as I've already mentioned, we want to drill wells wisely, uh, putting them in the right location. Uh, we want most of our wells to be successful, uh, and we don't want to drill too many dry holes. In order to drill the wells properly in the optimum location, we have to have knowledge of the subsurface. What are the rocks and what are the fluids in the location where we're thinking about drilling a well? Uh, we can get that knowledge because we have a lot of great technology. Uh, we can collect data, we can analyze the data, we can model how the basin formed and filled. We can model things like hydrocarbon generation and migration. And uh, there are a whole slew of tools in the geoscientist toolbox that uh, can be used to try to get that knowledge and make wise decisions about where to drill and to uh, maximize the impact of our investment dollars. And that technology uh, requires people that are very excellent in terms of their scientific abilities and their mathematical abilities and their engineering abilities. So we need men and women uh, to uh, apply the technology that we have and also to advance the technology so that uh, at, at, uh, in the future we can be even more successful in terms of understanding the subsurface and drilling in the right locations and cutting down on the number of dry holes that we drill and being more successful and uh, maximizing the results of the wells that we do drill. Uh, a asset or a field uh, has a life cycle. And so just as a person like myself has a life cycle, uh, I went from being an infant uh, to a teen, to a college student, to a uh, uh, new hire, uh, to a seasoned veteran, uh, to a retiree. Uh, so an oil field or a gas field also has a life cycle. The first thing that uh, we have to do is identify an opportunity. Uh, where is there a portion of the world where we can operate that has high potential in terms of uh, 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 revealing new oil and gas fields? We have to capture that opportunity. We have to get the right to explore, 
a certain piece of real estate onshore or offshore and, and uh, eventually drill wells and if we find oil and gas to uh, be able to uh, uh, produce that oil and gas and then sell it. Uh, we capture opportunities largely through uh, uh, le uh, lease sales. Once we have some uh, uh, acreage that we have a lease for, uh, we have to drill and make a discovery. Once we make the discovery, as I mentioned, we may have to delineate the field or confirm the field with a few additional wells. We then would install facilities if we have uh, convinced management that we can make money off of the new discovery. And then we would try to drain that field getting a maximum amount of hydrocarbons to the surface uh, while minimizing the cost so that we can have a positive cash flow. And then eventually we would abandon the field where we have extracted uh, uh, so much uh, oil and gas that uh, to get more out of it would cost more money than the uh, value of the additional oil or gas that we would uh, recover. So uh, early in the lifestyle, uh, life cycle, identifying opportunities and maybe a little bit into capturing the app opportunity, there's a subdivision with ex within exploration that most companies refer to as new ventures. So the people working new ventures are looking at where the next big uh, oil and gas discoveries might lie. The exploration people uh, would uh, take a list of uh, basins with high uh, hydrocarbon uh, potential, and then they would work to try to capture opportunities through lease, lease sales, perhaps uh, trading properties with another company. Uh, they would uh, try to decide where they should drill a uh, initial well, a wildcat, uh, and hopefully make a discovery of oil or gas or a combination oil with gas. If they are successful and they can delineate the field and convince management that this new discovery is worth making a new field, then the uh, asset would be turned over to the development geoscientist and they would worry about the details as to where the oil and gas uh, occurs and how best to uh, drill wells and uh, set up a platform in order to uh, maximize their production for the next uh, 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And finally, it would be turned over to production geoscientists who would worry about draining the field and determining when do we reach the point where it's no longer profitable to keep the field online. If uh, you go through a uh, series of the uh, lessons that are on the website. A lot of the exercises are based on a real life example from Australia. It's from the Gippsland Basin. The upper right has an index map of Australia and the little white rectangle in the southeast corner is the uh, uh, Bass Straits, which is between Australia proper and the island of Tasmania. The uh, blow up in the lower right uh, shows this uh, offshore basin in the Bass Straits. Uh, the Gippsland Basin is uh, one third onshore and two thirds offshore. And on that map uh, where it's blue, the offshore, uh, there's a number of green polygons and those are known oil fields and a number of red polygons, those are known gas fields. There's a yellow, arrow pointing to an elongate red polygon, and that is the Barracuda field. And so a lot of the exercises that you would work if you uh, 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 do this either as a course or uh, through private uh, individual studies, uh, we do a lot of work with this Barracuda gas field. And the exercises as you would do them in a sequence would take you from uh, a new venture stage through exploration, uh, drilling a wildcat, making the initial discovery, drilling some confirmation wells, and ultimately getting to the stage where you uh, come up with a plan as to how best to develop this uh, newly discovered 
uh, gas field. Uh, this slide has a number of uh, common uh, references that uh, I use throughout the 34 lessons. Uh, most of them are from uh, AAPG publications. Uh, a few of them are from offshore technology conference publications. Um, I wanted to uh, put this in uh, the uh, first lecture uh, and acknowledge uh, my thanks to uh, AAPG and OTC for allowing me to use uh, some of their copyrighted figures. And then uh, as we get into each of the uh, subsequent lessons, uh, there'll be additional references to materials that I've used either from uh, public, uh, publications or from uh, internet sites uh, for the material specific to that particular uh, lesson. So that's my uh, prepared comments. Uh, we have uh, about uh, 25 minutes left in the hour, and so if there are questions that have been typed in, uh, Danielle will, uh, will read some of those off to me, and I'll attempt to answer them. Uh, I hope that uh, Lesson 1 has, uh, has uh, intrigued you and maybe whetted your appetite, and that uh, we'll see you again for some of the uh, future lessons as your schedule permits. Well, thank you, Fred. Um, I'm just going to give everyone a minute to write in their questions really quickly. Um, just to let you know, um, this is, again, the first in a series of webinars um, that will be forthcoming. Um, the second lesson two will be um, on Thursday, um, this week, June 8th, um, at the same time, 2 p.m. And then we'll follow up the following week on Tuesday and Thursday, also at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, with lessons three and four. Um, so we have a couple of questions that just came in. Thanks. Um, and I can't read the full name. Damien Carden Cardenas. Um, and I, it's too, yeah. Anyway, the screen isn't large enough to show the rest of your name, so apologies. Um, how important do you think is biostratigraphy and exploration in order to reduce the cost during drilling? Is biostratigraphy underestimated or overestimated in, in the oil and gas industry? Uh, biostratigraphy is important in the exploration phase. Uh, we make pre-drill predictions as to the ages of the different uh, depositional sequences that we map using seismic. And we may have uh, nearby wells that help us to control what the ages of the rock units are. We may not. And when we drill a well, uh, they will recover mostly uh, micro uh, fossils uh, and use them to try to verify if our age predictions are close to being right or terribly uh, 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 in error. Um, it was uh, common when I started back in the late 70s for each company to have their own biostratigraphic section and they would have uh, specialists in forams and other specialists in radial area and the other type of uh, fossils to try to do the age dating. Uh, in about the mid 80s, a lot of the companies did away with their in-house biostratigraphers. And uh, there are a number of companies that uh, specialize in biostratigraphic analysis. And so a lot of the oil companies now send their samples to these uh, specialized companies, and then they'll get reports back from them about the, uh, uh, for a particular well, uh, a depth versus the uh, geological ages. Great, thanks, Fred. Um, so Walter Reed asks, when do you see a shift in the supply demand balance coming? Some project 2020, do you agree? Yeah, I guess that's an important uh, thing to mention. Uh, we all know that uh, the uh, oil and gas industry is in a big downturn. It's been in there for two years. Um, and largely that's because uh, right now we produce more oil and gas per day than we're used. And so there's a bit of an oversupply. And there's been a lot of uh, attempts, mainly by OPEC and some other uh, major producers, to try to curtail their production to uh, eliminate the backlog, if you will, of uh, reserves. And I think that the main 
control on uh, oil and gas prices is how well the supply demand balance uh, is reestablished. And so OPEC has uh, just extended for another nine months their limits on production. Um, sometimes the uh, OPEC nations agree in principle, but then uh, their particular country doesn't want to cut back as much, uh, and they're hoping all the other nations will cut back. Uh, and so there's some, uh, some kind of internal disagreement as to uh, living up to their agreements. Uh, part of the reason we have the glut is because uh, uh, non-OPEC nations uh, have been very successful with unconventional oil and gas, and we're getting a lot of uh, oil and gas out of tight rocks and, and out of shales, and that has uh, uh, added to the supply of oil and gas uh, in addition to what we were getting out of the conventional reservoirs. So. I tend to uh, read a fair amount on different people's opinions, and it ranges from uh, six months from now, everything will be back to normal, to uh, three or four years from now. And so depending on how optimistic or pessimistic you want to be, you can find experts, uh, and that's experts in quotations, uh, who will agree with you if you want to say that by the end of 2017, uh, things will be back to normal. Or if you're a little more pessimistic and you want to say it's going to be 2020 before we're really back uh, to normal. Um, I do see a lot of companies uh, have uh, reduced their staff uh, probably way too much. And once prices uh, stabilize and get in the uh, $55 to $60 a barrel range, I think there's going to start to be a lot of hiring. And a lot of uh, seasoned professionals like myself uh, have uh, either voluntarily or involuntarily left oil and gas. Uh, people my generation are probably not going to go back to a 40-hour uh, a week job. And so as they start to be staffed up, they're going to have to look for new, uh, new hires from uh, universities, either uh, ones that have graduated in the last couple of years or people that are going to graduate in 2017, 2018, 2019. So it's a little bleak right now in terms of the job market, but I think things are going to turn around, whether that's in six months or a year or 18 months, uh, hard for me to, uh, to uh, make an educated guess. I hope that helped. Yeah, um, I think it does, at least from my perspective. Um, we had a question about advice on how to pick an area of interest, and I think that more belongs with maybe lesson 12 through maybe 14. Would you agree with that, Fred, that maybe that's a question for a different lesson? Yeah, that um, uh, we'll cover a little bit in New Ventures, um, and it's somewhat, um, it's somewhat dependent on a company's um, projection into the future. Uh, some companies are very much controlled by their stock prices and investor confidence. And so in downturns like we currently have, they cut way back on their um, long-term uh, vision. Uh, other companies that maybe are a little more solid and uh, not quite so easily flustered, uh, they continue to look for new opportunities. Um, this is kind of a uh, time for some companies to really improve their acreage position because there's such little competition uh, for areas that are coming up for licensing. And uh, some companies are trying to sell assets to improve their um, uh, prof profit uh, or minimize their losses uh, for the, uh, the investment. Uh, and so uh, companies that uh, are a little deeper in their uh, financial pockets are able to pick up some, uh, some tracks that uh, someone else is trying to, to get rid of almost in a fire sale mode. Okay. Um, we have a question from Ann Way that says, um, 
How does the U.S. unconventional oil successes affect the offshore oil exploration activities? Well, we go back to the supply and demand and the success onshore with unconventionals has increased the supply and the demand um, you know, has not gone up as fast. And that's why we have a little bit of a surplus. And so as long as we have factors that are uh, increasing our, uh, uh, our reserves, uh, that's going to impact all of the other types of uh, exploration uh, uh, primarily. And so uh, fewer uh, dollars would be available for uh, bidding on acreage, fewer dollars would be available for drilling exploration wells, fewer, fewer dollars would be available for uh, drilling confirmation wells. And so the offshore tends to be an expensive place to operate, uh, but that uh, expense is uh, counterbalanced by the fact that in the offshore, we often make uh, uh, giant to super giant uh, discoveries. So as long as our supply is exceeding our demand, that's going to uh, impact both onshore and offshore in a, in a negative fashion. Um, so Fred, you commented a little bit about finding jobs because of that um, in the oil and gas industry. And so we've had quite a few questions about that. And so I hope to summarize just a few of the questions really quickly and kind of address it briefly so that we can get to some more of the technical questions. Um, because some people want to know about like what the best geoscience specialization is to get in like field work and international experience, but also, you know, um, if like an internship is a must have um, before getting a job okay. in the oil and gas industry. And so I'll stop there for a minute. And Okay. Um, I've given a lot of um, uh, career talks on campuses. Uh, I think I just made my um, visit to my 100th campus uh, in the last 12 years about. Uh, and so I've, I've you know, kind of had my thumb to the, um, the grad student and new hire uh, pulse. And what I advise uh, students, whether they're working on a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD, if they have a senior project or a master's thesis or a PhD thesis, I suggest that you work on something that you have a lot of interest and drive and passion for, as opposed to saying, well, I think oil companies would be interested in fluid flow in carbonate rocks in, uh, in the Far East. When we go out and recruit, and I did a, uh, a little bit of recruiting for ExxonMobil, um, our marching orders were to go out and find world-class scientists. And so we are looking for people that are skilled uh, in terms of understanding uh, what it takes to do a scientific investigation, to uh, frame a question, to collect data, to analyze the data, and come up with a, a conclusion. And so I would rather see somebody who has a lot of passion for, uh, let's say, uh, volcanic rocks on Hawaii, uh, and do a superb job on uh, framing a question, collecting data, doing the data analysis, summarizing it, and giving uh, a sense of you know why why that study was important than somebody that says well I'm not really interested in carbonates and fluid flows kind of uh, not really something that uh, excites me but I think that's what oil companies will do and so I'll do my thesis on that and what a recruiter would probably pick up on real quick is that the latter case where a person doesn't have that much passion does a mediocre thesis, and so they're going to conclude, well, this might be a mediocre scientist, so why do we want to hire them? Whereas somebody would, uh, another rec uh, a recruiter would uh, look at the person that did uh, a study on uh, um, uh, igneous rocks on Hawaii and say, this person really understands the scientific process. They collected data. They had hurdles that they overcame. They did their analysis. 
they were able to present it clearly and concisely as long as they would be interested in using their skills looking for oil and gas, uh, I would have a, a better uh, uh, sense of recommending them for a, a position with my company than the person that's done a mediocre job on something that uh, may be more relevant, but they haven't proved to themselves, to, to, a, to me, that they're really going to be an excellent scientist. Um, in terms of internships, uh, those are very hard to get. They always have been, and they're even more difficult right now. Part of the reason is that, um, let's say, uh, I'll use ExxonMobil since that's where I have my most experience. Uh, let's say ExxonMobil wants to uh, bring in 20 uh, interns uh, in a particular year. They have to find a, um, uh, a person with a lot of experience that can mentor that intern and help them get up the learning curve, understand what they are supposed to be doing with their three or four months of their internship and uh, guide them and lead them and direct them and, and advise them. Uh, we don't have that many uh, seasoned mentors or people that want to do mentoring. And uh, if ExxonMobil in a given year has, let's say 15 new hires, the new hires have more priority in terms of getting mentors. And then the uh, interns uh, have secondary um, priority in terms of getting mentors. So the real uh, bottleneck is how many mentors does somebody have, a company have, uh, in terms, uh, in, in balance with how many new hires are coming in and how many uh, interns uh, would we like to have. And so the lack of uh, available mentors has caused the number of internships to, to fall. My experience is that about 80% of the people that uh, do a intern with a company uh, get a job offer either at the end of their internship or within six to 12 months. So it's not automatic if I intern with company X that they're going to offer me a job. Uh, usually the number of interns is maybe a third of the total hiring um, target for a particular company. So two thirds of the people that will get uh, a job uh, did not have an internship with the company that's uh, making that job offer. So certainly it's a plum in your cap if you have an internship and you have three or four months experience working in an exploration, a development or a production office. But I don't think that means that if you don't get an internship, that uh, really kills your chance of uh, landing a great job. Great, thank you so much, Fred. I think that covers a lot of ground. Um, and so um, one of the questions was from one of your early slides about what MBDOE meant on the y-axis um, of the projection. I think it means million barrels. I don't know if DOE means Department of Energy, but <laughs> um, maybe you can address that. Okay, it's a million barrels per day, oil equivalent. Nice. And so <laughs> we have a way of uh, taking uh, gas and let's say we have uh, six trillion cubic feet of gas, there's an equation that allows uh, oil and gas companies to convert six uh, uh, trillion cubic feet into an equivalent value as if it was oil. And so uh, oil equivalent means that you're uh, trying to um, calibrate uh, the value of oil versus the value of gas versus the value of coal versus the value of other types of energy. Thank you. Um, people have been asking about um, modeling programs that you've used in your career, um, but also if we'll be using any programs later on in the course. So um, you can address that. Yeah. Um, with the course, uh, we will not use any software. Uh, 
there is not a universal software package to do just about anything. And so if, um, if it was possible for everyone to have uh, program X, um, uh, you know, all the data would have to be loaded and formatted and uh, uh, I'd have the challenge of uh, training people, how do, you, how do you do this procedure with this piece of software? And then if you learned it for uh, software X and then on campus or in your first uh, job, you're using uh, software Y, uh, that doesn't really help you. So uh, I'm trying to look more at uh, things from a fundamental point of view and what's the, the science or the geology or the geophysics, uh, what's the thought process that you go through. And so uh, all of the exercises are done with uh, uh, paper copies of seismic, paper maps, uh, and, and uh, paper charts and cross plots and this and that and the other thing. Um, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of companies, uh, when they're training new hires, uh, train them without software because they want them to be thinking geologically and geophysically, and they don't want to get bogged down in, uh, well, how do I zoom or how do I change the color or if I don't like the scale, which buttons do I push? And so um, uh, there, there will be no software used. Some of my displays will be based on software. Uh, the software in my uh, history uh, has largely been uh, IESX, which is uh, a Schlumberger product now, and uh, Voxel Geo, which is a paradigm geophysical uh, software package. And of course, my favorite software package is PowerPoint. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Um, so that kind of concludes our questions, um, the relevant ones, I, I think, that are more specific. So, um, gosh, okay, so there, of course there's a couple other ones that are coming in really quickly, <laughs> but I don't know if you want to give any, like, last words, um, Fred, while I kind of look through this. Well, you sent me quickly uh, uh, today a, uh, a, a question about the calculating reserves. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the person that is interested in that, uh, lesson number 30 uh, is on estimating uh, recovery. Uh, you could say estimating reserves. And so um, I won't go into a detailed explanation now. Uh, since it's available on the uh, IRIS website, uh, if somebody's interested in that specific topic, uh, they could uh, look at the PowerPoint, which has uh, speaking points on it. They could look at the exercise. Uh, they can look at the exercise solution. Uh, and uh, um, uh, I doubt in the summer, this summer, uh, we'll get to uh, lesson number 30. Right. Right. So um, just to recap, um, like Fred said, a lot of people have been asking about where they can find the slides. The slides are already available at um, iris.edu slash HQ for headquarters slash in class. And if you uh, click on the course link, it goes straight to Fred's course. Um, and then you would just click on lesson one and you can download any slides, any exercises. Um, homework is there too. Um, and there's a question about whether this course will not have, the, the, we can't provide certification for this course. Um, and yeah, this is just a way to kind of capture all of Fred's material in one place. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's why we're doing it this summer. So again, this was the first one. The second one will take place this Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, Eastern time. <laughs> I should be more specific in the time zones because I know a lot of people are all around the world. Um, so again, Thursday, it'll be Tuesdays and Thursdays this summer at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, you can always email me at webinar at iris.edu if you have any questions. I'm happy to get you connected that way. Um, and so I think with that, this concludes the first webinar, and I hope to see all of you on Thursday. All right, thanks. Thank you, Fred. Well, thank you, and thank everyone who, uh, who, who tuned in for this. Thanks so much. All right, so this concludes the webinar, and have a great rest of your day. All right, take care, everyone.